I hope you have been successful in solving the paper. Uh, it is a fairly simple paper which just revises all the things that we have touched upon. We will go through the paper uh, question by question. So, let us start with the first question. The first question was where we have to write true or false and explain the reason for the answer. And of course, you should give yourself marks only if your reasoning is correct. So, the first part of this 1a says the human disruption index for CO2 is 0 0.305. Now, you look at what is the definition of the human disruption index. Human disruption index which if you remember was proposed by John Holdren is the ratio of the human generated flow of a particular global pollutant, human generated flow annually divided by the natural or the baseline flow. natural or the baseline flow. Now, what happens is that uh, in this would mean and we said that if the human generated flow is one or more than one then we have a problem. HDI suppose this HDI for CO2 was 0 0.0005 then nature would be able to take care of the CO2 emissions very easily it is small as compared to the natural or baseline flow and then there would not be a CO2 problem. So, the this statement is false. The HDI for CO2 is much higher it is approximately 0.1 and since the concentration of CO2 is increasing and it's, uh, it, it is not possible for nature now to take care of it and that is why there is a global warming problem. Uh, so, the answer as we said is false because if the HDI was so small then CO there would not have been a CO2 problem. If the CO2 flows the human generated flows would be much lower than what is uh, generated by nature and what nature can actually sustain. So, this was the first question let us go to 1b. 1B is saying ONGC Videsh acquired natural gas mines in Kazakhstan. This results in an improvement in India's energy security. So, as we said energy security, uh, the definition of energy security is where we would like to see that our energy sources will not get disrupted and we have, we can have uh, uninterrupted supply of energy that is required for the society. Um, if we add natural gas mines in Kazakhstan, which will increase the control and sovereignty over gas supplies in India and then this will increase our energy security. So, the answer to this is that this is true and this will increase our uh, energy security because we have control over additional gas resources which will be under the sovereign uh, under the ownership of the company ONGC Videsh and so that is that is this is uh, going to be this answer is true. Let us look at the third question. The third question says the cost of saved carbon for a grid connected 1 megawatt PV plant, the same plant exactly the same technical configuration and characteristics will be the same for a location in Kerala as it is for a location in Chhattisgarh. Now, what is the cost of saved carbon? Cost of saved carbon is the incremental annualized cost of that measure. So, that would mean what is the capital cost of that PV plant and when we annualize it and then divide that by the annual carbon dioxide savings. Uh, 
So, couple of things. The first thing is that in two locations in Kerala and Chhattisgarh, the solar insulation may be different. So, even though the plant is the same, the outputs may be different. Of course, this may not be drastically different. The second thing is that when you look at the supply mix, in Chhattisgarh, the grid is predominantly thermal. Chhattisgarh grid predominantly thermal, which means that when we put a PV plant there, we are actually replacing coal based power and the amount of CO2 savings would be much higher and the CO2 per kilowatt hour. In Kerala, it is a predominantly hydro grid. So, so the CO2 per kilowatt hour would be much lower and hence they, these two would be quite different. Solar insulation may also be different. So, the answer is that this is going to be false. It is not going to be the same. The answer to this is false. Let us look at the next part 1D. 1D says solar radiation is a form of secondary energy. Remember what was our definition of primary and secondary energy? Primary energy is the energy that is available in nature, it goes through a sequence of conversion steps to get secondary energy. So, this is uh, false because obviously solar radiation is available in nature, it is a primary energy and not a form of secondary energy. So, the answer to this is clearly false. Okay, let us look at 1E. 1E says the carbon dioxide emission factor of a thermal power plant will remain the same even if its energy efficiency is increased. So, let us look at what is a carbon dioxide emission factor. Carbon dioxide emission factor carbon dioxide emission factor will be the kg of CO2 per kilowatt hour of electricity. That is the carbon dioxide emission factor. Let us see what is the efficiency. Efficiency this is going to be the electricity output in kilowatt hours divided by the energy input right. So, we can write this as kilowatt hour of electricity divided by kg of coal into the energy content of coal. Now, if the coal composition remains the same, what would happen is that if we look at kg CO2 per kilowatt hour, that will be equal to kg of coal per kilowatt hour into kg of carbon per kg of coal that is the percentage of carbon in the fuel into 44 by 12. Now, if the efficiency increases for the same amount of electricity generated, we would be using less coal. So, this would decrease and if the composition of the coal remains the same, this would mean that the emission factor would decrease. Emission factor would decrease if the efficiency increases would decrease and the statement here says that if the uh, carbon emission factor of a thermal power plant will remain the same 
even if the energy efficiency is increased. So, the statement is clearly false. If the efficiency increases and it is the same coal that we are talking about, the emission factor would decrease. So, let us look at the uh, 1 f, the next statement. Uh, it says that it is not possible for a country with a lower electricity consumption per capita than the world average to have a human development in, uh, index greater than any country that has an electricity consumption that is more than 120 percent of the world average. So, now what you if you remember the plot that we had shown where we showed the HDI if you show HDI versus electricity use. and the human development index. You clearly see there is a pattern, but there is also a scatter in the data and you have a curve something like this, which saturates beyond a point, but at any electricity use, there are a large number of countries where there could be a variety of human development indexes. So, HDI as we saw is a composite index of a set of things, the life expectancy at birth, life expectancy at birth, income and education. So, it is possible there are countries which are using less energy services, but which have developed better quality of health and education. So, many countries have focused on health and education and they can have a better quality of life, even though they have not used uh, increased their electricity use. So, it is possible that there are countries where it is not possible with a lower electricity than the world average. It is possible that there are countries which have lower consumption than world average uh, to have a better uh, quality of life. There are countries where which have significant uh, high e electricity consumption and which is inefficient, there is much more inequality and the income, the health and education is not that good. So, this statement is essentially, um, it is false because it is possible for a country to have a higher HDI. In general, there is a minimum amount of electricity required for improving the quality of life, but within when you make the comparison, there are many other factors apart from the electricity use which affect the HDI. So, these are the six statements and if you have got the uh, answer true or false correct and your reasoning is correct, then you can give yourself the full two marks for each of these sections. So, now let us look at the second question. The second question is on the resources. It is a country had an annual production of coal in 2018 of 600 million tons and uh, the production of coal in 2013 was 500 million tons. The proven reserves is 140,000 million tons. Calculate the static R by P ratio. So, the static R by P ratio that we calculate should be for the most recent year. So, let us take 600 million tons. All that we have to do is divide 140,000 million tons by 600 million tons and we get 233 years. This is the static R by P ratio. The second part of the question is considering the compound annual growth rate during 2013 to 18 as the growth rate for an exponential growth model, calculate the number of years that the coal will last. And obviously, that is going to be less than this 233 because we are talking of an exponential growth model. So, let us see P 2018 is 600 million tons. And P 2013 is 500 million tons. These are similar to the numbers for India actually for coal. So, we if we want to find the growth rate, it will be 1 plus 
g 2013 to 18 is 5 years 1 plus g raised to 5 is equal to 600 by 500 1.2 and so g comes out to be 0 0.037 or 3.7 percent compound annual growth rate of 3.7 percent during these 5 years. Now, let us see how do we calculate the number of years for which the coal will last. So, we can just take this, we just derived this earlier p plus p into 1 plus g and so on p into 1 plus g raised to n. We can, you can of course, if you remember the formula that is also fine, but you can just derive it in one or two steps. So, that is this gives us S into 1 plus G minus 1 is P into 1 plus G raised to N plus 1 minus P. So, S by P and this is the S by P is the total uh, that we were looking at um, is the uh, static r by p ratio this should be 1 plus g raised to n plus 1 minus 1 by g. Substitute this we get 233 is equal to 1.037 raised to n plus 1 minus 1 by 0 0.037. Right. So, what we can then do is we can just, uh, you can see that this is going to be equal to 233 into 0 0.037 is equal to 1.037 raised to n plus 1 minus 1. This comes out to be 8.621 can take the 1 on this side, this comes to 1.037 raised to n plus 1, right. You can just take ln on both sides and you get uh, ln of 9.621 is 1 point is equal to n plus 1 into ln 1.037 and you get n plus 1 is equal to 2.264 by 0 0.0363 and you get this as 62.3. n plus 1 is 62.3, so n approximately equal to 61 years. right and so that means the it will last from 2018 plus 61 year in which it gets completed will be 202079 ad so we that's the model earlier we got r by p ratio as 233 years now we have got it as 61 years so that's the question part b let us look at part C. The coal production data has been fitted. So, you have a data set and it has been fitted to that data set and an S shaped curve, logistic curve that means this is production like this. This is Q p by T, Q p is integral P d t that is what has been done and this has been fitted for an ultimate reserve of 140,000 million tons and this is the equation that we got Q p this has been given to you 140,000 divided by 1 plus 600 e raised to minus 0 0.06 t where Q p is the cumulative production and it starts from t is equal to 0 is 1960. So, the question that has been asked is calculate the time when the peak production is reached. 
Now, if you remember when we had derived this, we had derived the, you can differentiate this and uh, find the point at which we are getting the um, peak that is going to be the differentiation of this gives you dqp by dt will be the production and the second differential of that and uh, I set that equal to 0 that will be when the production is maximum. You can check this will give you tqp by is ln a by bq infinity. This was the formula that we had derived and we can substitute the values. This is going to be ln 600 by 0 0.06. 0 0.06 is bq infinity and this is your a. Uh, so, this turns out to be approximately 106.6. .6, so, it is about 107 years. That is when the peak will occur. And uh, if t is equal to 0 is 1960, so peak will occur in 2067 AD. Remember we found in the uh, exponential growth case that it will last get depleted in 2079, here it will, the peak will occur in 2067. So, if we want to calculate the second thing which has been asked is calculate the time when the peak production is reached and that we have just done and when 90 percent is exhausted. So, when 90 percent is exhausted, we want to put q p is 0 0.9 into 140,000. This is equal to 140,000 by 1 plus 600 e raised to minus 0 0.6 t 90. t 90 is what we want to find out. So, then this becomes 1 plus 600 e raised to minus 0 0.06, sorry 0 0.06, 0 0.06 t 90 is equal to 1 by 0 0.0, 0.9, this is 1 point 1. So, we get 600 e raised to minus point and we can take logs and you get t is 143.2 years. So, 1960 plus 143 comes out to be 2103 AD. Then you have asked compare the three estimates of time duration of coal in ABC. So, obviously, the smallest value comes out to be with exponential growth, t exponential growth less than t Perl curve or S shaped or the Hubbard's model S shaped curve or Perl curve and this will be less than the static R by P ratio. These are three different ways in which we get estimates of time for which the resources will last. Okay. So, the last part of this question says what are the limitations to the Hubbard's model and uh, are there any other approaches possible. So, there are uh, in all of this uh, the technology in Hubbard's model technology is assumed to be static. So, what happens is that with time uh, resor resources which are not considered to be mineable based on improvements in technology and economics, uh, they many of these now become uh, mineable and so the, uh, the estimate of the reserves changes. So, that is one that is one uh, problem with the model. Uh, the second problem with the model is that uh, the curve considered is symmetric about the point of inflection, but in actual practice if you reach the peak beyond that, it will not remain symmetric. Also there are other substitutes, 
and so this is that uh, that 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 is not considered in this model another approach or other approaches possible there are approaches where you have you create a cost of supply and you can see this this was there in the global energy assessment chapter on resources if you look at the quantity that you can get or the reserves which are there at different costs of supply we can actually create a supply curve in terms of cost of supply and the quantity of the reserve. That means today we may get it at some cost, there may be other reserves which are relatively more difficult to mine where they can have, so we can have basically a different things and these could be, these need not be deterministic, these could also be probabilistic. So let us look at now the next question, the question 3 is a question on economics, we are talking of, uh, let me just read out and explain the question to you then we will go over it step by step. Diesel engine generators and you may see this all over the country wherever there is a, a problem with power supply. We usually have what is known as a genset, it is a diesel engine come generator, they are commonly used as backup power supply and we want to look at a company with a discount rate of 30 percent which has a diesel engine generator DG set of rating 25 kilowatt for its outlets as backup supply with the normal electricity supply coming from the grid. And in 2018, it, we are told that the diesel engine generator was operated for a total of 800 hours with a total electricity generation of 12,000 kilowatt hours. So the details of the generator are given, capital cost of the diesel engine generator is 4 lakhs, life of the DG set is 10 years, then there is an operating cost, there is a fuel and the non-fuel, non-fuel operating maintenance cost annually is given to us as 25,000 rupees. The efficiency is given as 35 percent, fuel used is light diesel oil, the price, the color energy content and the price and the carbon percentage is given. So let us see what all we are asked to determine. The first thing is calculate the annual amount of LDO used, light diesel oil used and the annual fuel cost. So first let us see, we the total electricity generation annually is given as. Total electricity generation is 12,000 kilowatt hours and we want to find out how much fuel is being used. So we have the fuel input will be the generation divided by the efficiency, 12,000 kilowatt hours, 1 kilowatt hour is 1 kilowatt kilojoule per second into 60 seconds per minute into 60 minutes per hour. So this is going to be 3600 kilojoules per kilowatt hour. So now this numerator is in kilojoules divided by the efficiency 35 percent fuel input in kilojoules is this. And uh, if we want to um, uh, find out, so this is, this is the fuel input in kilojoules. Uh, if we want to find out in megajoules, this is going to be 12,000 into 3,600 by 0.35 divided by 10 raised to 3, this is in megajoules and uh, this comes out to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 29 megajoules. If we want to find out how many kgs of fuel is used, we know what is the energy content of 1 kg of coal, we are okay, 1 kg of sorry, 1 kg of LDO, the diesel oil is 41 megajoules that is given in the question. So we just divide this by 41 and we get approximately 3000 kgs, 3010 kgs of LDO in one year. So what is the annual fuel cost then? Annual fuel cost is take this and multiply it by the price. 
So, 3010 into 50 rupees per kg comes out to be rupees 1.51 lakhs. The next part is to calculate the annualized life cycle cost and the cost of generated electricity for the LDO system. Um, so, if we look at the cost, we have the annualized life cycle cost will be the annualized capital cost. Let us calculate this in lakhs. So, we have the DG set has been told that it costs 4 lakhs, 4 lakhs into the capital recovery factor so that we annualize it. Discount rate is 30 percent, life is 10 years plus the fuel cost which we just now calculated which was 1.51 lakhs plus the non-fuel ONM which was 25,000 rupees which is in lakhs which is 0.25. So, this is in lakhs, CRF 0.310, we have already calculated this is 0.31.3 raised. This is 0.323, so ALCC is 4 into 0.323 plus 1.51 plus 0.25. So, this comes out to be 3.1 lakhs. Cost of generated electricity if you want to calculate, cost of generated electricity, we divide this by the total amount that we are generating annually. So, it is 3.1 into 10 raised to 5 divided by 12,000 and this will be rupees per kilowatt hour and if you calculate this it comes out to be 25.4 rupees per kilowatt hour. And we have done some rounding off. So, if you get something which is similar um, um, off by a, a decimal place or so, then it is all right. So, this is the uh, amount of, so keep this number in mind, we will compare it with the new. The next part is compute the carbon dioxide emission factor for the DG set and the annual carbon dioxide emitted. So, annual kg of CO2 we said 3010 kgs of diesel. We are also told that a, a, a diesel has 84 percent carbon. So, this will be 3010 into 0.84. This is the kg of carbon which is emitted. Now, C plus O2 giving you CO2, this is 12, this is 44. So, kg of CO2 per kg of carbon is into 44 by 12. We have done this a number of times, so you probably just remember this factor. But so this way we can get this, this will give us 9000, sorry, 9271 kgs of CO2 annually or if you just they talked about carbon, it would have been 2500 kgs of carbon. So, this is 9.3 tons of CO2 being emitted. Now, let us see what was the emission factor. Emission factor is the amount that we are emitting 9271 kgs divided by the output which is in kilowatt hour. So, this will be kg per kilowatt hour and if you do this number, you will find that this is 0 0.773 kg of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So, this is a, if you look at the numbers that are there in our power sector, you will find that this is a reasonable number, it is within that kind of range. Uh, the power sector is a sector which is responsible for significant CO2 emissions. 
let's look at the next part of the question. Next part of the question is that there is a proposal to replace the DG set with a solar PV module. Why are we trying to do this? Well, we have the DG has emissions, both local emissions as well as CO2 emissions and if we replace this with solar, then the, uh, these emissions would be avoided. And there is an annual cost of fuel, if you replace it with solar, there will be no annual cost of fuel. So, uh, in this case, the solar PV module rating is 10 kilowatt, uh, module life of 25 years, price 6 lakhs and uh, in the battery rating of 30 kilowatt hour, price 2.4 lakhs, life 5 years and balance of system power electronics controllers 1 lakh, life 10 years. So, assume that the final electricity supplied by the system from the battery is the same as that of the DG. So, if we look at this, we can just take this as total capital cost. This is very similar to the example that we had done. 6 plus 2.4 plus 1, this is 9.4 lakhs. What is the annual saving? The annual saving is essentially uh, the difference in the fuel price. The ONM is almost similar. So, the annual fuel saving is 1.5 lakhs. One point five lakhs, and what is then the simple payback period? It's just going to be nine point four lakhs, which is the investment divided by one point five, is approximately six point three years. Now the uh, point in this is that uh, this is. Uh, this considers the entire capital because we are saying that the DG is already there. We could also take in some cases if we are uh, if it is a greenfield project, we can take the uh, initial cost, we can subtract from this 4 lakhs and then the payback periods would be much lower. Um, if we consider the, if we neglect the non-fuel ONM in the case of PV, then the annual savings could be slightly higher. Uh, so this is the uh, this is in terms of the simple payback period. Now let's calculate what is the initial cost and simple payback period. We've done this. Calculate annualized life cycle cost. So annualized life cycle cost for the PV system is going to be six into CRF 0.325. PV modules have a higher life. The battery 2.4 lakhs capital recovery factor discount rate is the same. Life is 5 years plus the balance of system 1 CRF 0.3 10 years plus let us say 0.25 lakhs is the if we say that the, the non-fuel ONM is almost the same, then this is going to be 6 into the CRF for 0.325 turns out to be approximately 0 0.3 itself, 0 0.301 or something. This is 2.4 into 0 0.411. Please check these numbers. And this is 1 into 0 0.323 plus 0.25. When we add this up, this turns out to be 3.36 lakhs. And the cost of generated electricity then becomes 3.36 into 10 raised to 5 divided by 12,000 turns out to be rupees 28 per kilowatt hour. Just compare this with the earlier number that we had. Uh, that number was 25.4. So, this looks to be a costlier option. Of course, it depends on the discount rate and uh, what is the scarcity of capital. If you do the same numbers with a discount rate of 10 percent, you might find that the PV seems to be viable. In this case, let us the last part is um, should the company opt for the PV battery? Well, 
based on the economic calculations and the discount rate, the company would not opt for the uh, PV battery system um, because the ALCC is going to be uh, uh, less for the DZ system. Uh, however, if we look at uh, the um, cost of safe carbon and if there is an incentive based on the carbon and you have a carbon credit, then they just might make it viable. So, let us calculate the cost of safe carbon. This is going to be 3.36 minus 3.1 divided by 9271. This is the annualized life cycle cost in the case of PV, annualized life cycle cost in the case of DG, the difference in that divided by the tons of carbon, the kgs of carbon saved and this turns out to be rupees 3.34 per kg of CO2 or rupees 3340 per ton of CO2. And you can compare it with the carbon price for a CER, CER is 1 ton of CO2 and, and so you can see this um, and compare it with that. So, if the CERs are sold at a price which is greater than uh, 3340, then of course, it, this will become viable. So, we have seen this option, it is uh, essentially very simple uh, in terms of it is a simple application of what we had learnt in the energy economics and the emission factor. Now, let us look at the fourth question. <clears throat> the fourth question talks about, so this is a uh, data for Sweden for two different years, 2010 and 2016 and you can see uh, the populations growing but not much, 9.3 million and 9.9 .9 million and look at the GDP in market exchange rate. Uh, it's been growing and interestingly GDP in purchasing power parity uh, less than the GDP in the market exchange rate and the total primary energy supply you can see from it has declined the electricity consumption CO2 emissions and the energy imports. So, based on this these are all available for our IEA statistics and uh, the uh, aggregate data is also given to you for India and the world in terms of and this is for snapshot in time in 2016. Here we have both 2010 and 2016, we have the similar numbers now uh, overall indicators for India and the world and the question which is involved is a comparison of the, uh, in, uh, the Swedish uh, energy sector and the economy with India and the world. So, the first thing which has been asked is what is the GDP per capita, what is the difference between the GDP based on market exchange rate and GDP based on purchasing power parity, which one should be used for inter country comparisons and in the case of Sweden the GDP per um, purchasing power parity is lower than GDP market exchange rate, is this also true for India. So, the straightforward calculations first GDP per capita we just take the GDP and divide it by the population 560 by 9.9 .9, turns out to be 56.6 billion and dollars in, in this will be billion by million. So, this turns out to be 56,000 566 dollars per capita and if you see the India, uh, well we did not have this here, um, India numbers will of course be lower and this is based on the uh, market exchange rate uh, 2016 GDP market exchange rate. Similar thing if we did based on purchasing power parity we find that this is 45,000 252 dollars per capita. Generally GDP per purchasing power parity is 
used for inter-country comparisons and that is to adjust for the fact that in different economies there are different types of uh, when you look at the exchange rate does not always reflect the purchasing power. Uh, so, the cost of living and prices in Sweden is high higher than the uh, uh, basis. So, the actual GDP is overstated when you correct it for GDP by purchasing power parity that amount which is there turns out to be lower. And the, so, in the case of Sweden is the GDP per is lower is this also true for India. This is not true for India, for India in on the other hand the GDP, uh, the, uh, GDP in uh, the market exchange rate in US dollars uh, is much lower than uh, the actual value of that money. Uh, so, the GDP per purchasing power parity is higher than the GDP market exchange rate.